John needs very little introduction, founder of the Zachman uh, Framework, chairman of Zachman International and executive director of the FIAC Institute, chairman of the Zachman Institute. Uh, I've had the privilege of seeing him present on a couple of occasions and introducing him on a couple of occasions. Like that. Uh, it's always fun, it's always entertaining, and I'm pleased to say that we have a very good friend in John Zachman. Alan, thank you. I You're appreciate welcome. that. You know, Alan's uh, uh, introductory comments, uh, uh, in, uh, they tempt me to digress before I even have started the material. <laughs> The, uh, I have been in uh, General Electric and I've been in uh, Virgin Atlantic, I've been in Federal Express. I did not meet uh, Richard Branson, I didn't meet Jack Welch and uh, Smith, I forgot his first name, but I did not meet them. Uh, but I, but uh, I, I've been in, in those places and I had a friend of mine who did a survey of 108 CEOs around mostly North America. I don't think he talked to Richard Branson, but he talked to Jack Welch, he talked to to Lee Iacocca, I talked to, uh, to uh, Smith at FedEx, he talked to uh, Sandy Weil, who's at uh, Citibank, and, and to a person, I was shocked when I, when I saw the survey, actually. To a person, they all said, the biggest problem facing the enterprise is change. And when I heard that, I thought I had to explain to the CEOs of the world that the big problem is change, you know. It turns out they already knew that, okay? <laughs> you have to be fairly smart to be the CEO. I wasn't giving them credit to be who they were, actually. So, but when I saw that the biggest problem facing enterprises changes, is 108 out of 108, my reaction was, well, if the CEO thinks the biggest problem facing enterprises change, where is the executive vice president in charge of change management? Because if nobody's in charge, the high probability is low to zero that you're going to be able to accommodate change. So, I I, I would argue that. Uh, well, one, one thing, I haven't developed this material for you guys yet, but there are two reasons why you do architecture. Uh, one is complexity, and the other one is change. Okay, so if you, if you want to create a building like this, you are going to describe it before you can create it. So you have a complexity. You don't start with an ax and a force and start chopping down trees, basically. You start with architecture. You have to, if you can't describe it, you can't create it. Now, once you get it created, if you want to change it, the baseline for managing change is architecture, actually. If you want to start, if, if, the, if uh, the Western Hotel takes an order to put 10,000 people in this, uh, this room tomorrow morning, banquet style seating, uh, and uh, 8 o'clock in the morning, big fancy party, well, they couldn't put 10,000 people in this room, I'll tell you what. Something has to change. Okay, so how do you, how do, you do that? Well, you call up the engineering department and say, hey, uh, uh, tomorrow morning we got 10,000 people showing up. We gotta have we, we gotta have uh, banquet style seating, 10 people at a table. So we have to change the building. So send up the architecture so we can figure out what to do. And uh, what happens if the engineering department says, send up the what? Architecture? You mean building architecture? You mean building wide architecture? You mean building wide architecture at excruciating level of detail? Uh, it shows where all the wires are and the outlets and the pipes and the plumbing and so on, but you can't do it. You, you, can't, you can't do it. It would take too long, it would cost too much. It would create enterprise or building wide architecture, excruciating level of detail, and even if we had spent the time and the money to create that, uh, it wouldn't be any good for what you guys want to do because you guys keep changing the building. We can't keep the architecture up to date anyway. So the, the, uh, the uh, architectural construct we have won't represent the reality of the enterprise. It, so it wouldn't be any good to, to uh, do what you want to do anyway. So basically, we don't have any architecture. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, so what do, what do we do? Well, you have three possibilities. We already have an instantiated building. The thing already exists. You can get a bunch of guys with axes and sledgehammers to come in here and start knocking out the walls. <laughs> Not with me in this room. You can make some relatively small changes. You can lose the whole thing. You know, you could. You, this is not a very tasteful metaphor to use right now. But you can take the strength members out of a hundred-story building around the 90th floor elevator shaft. The thing could implode on you. Holy smokes! We don't want to do that. You know, maybe we better call an architect and have him help us. You call an architect. The architect comes in. Say, hey, tomorrow morning we got 10,000 people. Bank of South City. You got to change the building. Uh, when, when, can, when can it start to work? Architect says, well, I can start right now, but uh, where's your architecture? So we don't have any architecture, actually. That's why I called you, you know. So what? 
You want me to change your building and you don't have any architecture? Are you crazy? Nobody in their right mind is going to change this building without architecture. The architect will be in here with drills and tape measures trying to recreate the architectural representation from the standing edifice. There will be reverse engineering, the as-is configuration from the existing instantiation. They'll do all kind of research. They'll go out of the library to find, try to find pictures of this thing being built in a, new, in a newspaper. And they'll do all, all kind of research before they ever touch this thing. Hey, that takes time. It costs money, you know. We don't have time to do that. Well, here's your third possibility. It's obvious this building is exhausted as useful life. You might as well tear this one down and build a new one. <laughs> this time, build it with a bigger room. I mean, those are the three options you have if you want to change something that already exists. And the basic point is, if you want to change something that already exists, you are going to have architecture one way or another. You have to create the architecture. Now, the reason I'm saying this is, if 108 out of 108 CEOs, of course, those were high visibility CEOs, said the biggest problem facing the architecture is change, uh, who ought to own enterprise architecture? Well, I would submit it's got to be a general management responsibility. It, ought, it needs to be the executive vice if, it, if the CEO thinks the biggest problem facing the enterprise is change, the CEO ought to be in charge of enterprise architecture. And if uh, he or she is not going to be in charge, it ought to be the person they see the next day when they come in, uh, every morning when they come in the office. Hey, you know, Rolf, how's it going on the architecture? So, <laughs> uh, so it probably should be a, a general management responsibility. I mean, that's where I would take it. Now, I, I'm rushing a little bit. I, you know, the, you know I, I promised Alan I'm going to do this in an hour. I'm going to do four days. I'm packing about four days of material into a half an hour or into one hour. So. I'm going to rush through it a little bit because I want to come to a, bring you to some conclusions about what I would do relative to, you know, take putting the two things together. I put, put TOGAP together with the, my framework. And in fact, I kind of integrate them. In fact, I know, you know, I've known Alan for a number of years, and he was in Johannesburg a number of years ago, introduced me to a TOGAP conference. And he said, you know, for a lot of years, I thought it was either Zachman or TOGAP. He said, that's incorrect. Actually, it's Zachman and Togaf. So, so that, that basically is where I'm going to take this. It's, a Zach, it's Zachman and Togaf. And, uh, but I'm gonna, I have to do a little bit of tutorial work. I know there's a number of people here who have seen me talk about this subject before, so I don't want to bore all of you guys to death. But at the same time, there's a number of people who don't, don't, who've never heard me talk about this. So I'll give you a little bit of a tutorial kind of introduction to enterprise architecture, and then I'll try to build enough of this rationale, the logic, so I can draw it to some conclusions, okay? And basically, how would you integrate uh, the, the TOGAF and the Zachman framework, which I obviously think that's where we want to go to. In any case, a little introduction. The first question turns out to be, well, what is architecture? What, uh, what is it? Some people think this is architecture, the Roman Colosseum. Oh, let's see. Wait a minute here. Ah, uh, let me see. Uh -huh. Some people that think uh, that that is architecture. Now, notice that is a common misconception. This is not architecture. The same misconception about enterprise, what leads people to misconstrue enterprise architecture as being big, monolithic, static, inflexible, unachievable, and it takes you a lot, it costs too much. If you think that is architecture, I'm going to tell you, that's big and monolithic and static. It took a long time, it cost a lot of money. How long do you think it took to build that thing? <laughs> not a day. Not a week, not a year, not a decade. It was a couple of decades to build it. In fact, the architecture had to be done long before they ever created the Roman Colosseum. They could not have even ordered up the stones to stack on top of each other until somebody did the architecture. The architecture had to be done long before they ever created the Roman Colosseum. Now, th that is the result of architecture. In the result, you can see the architect's architecture. The result is an implementation, an instance. That is one instance of the architecture. Now, they could have built 100 of these things. They only built one. Actually, it was in New Zealand a few years ago, and I said, they could have built 100 of these things. They only built one. Some guy in the back of the room said, well, oh, well actually, they built three. I said, oh, yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah, he even knew where they were. I was really impressed, you know. So, so I was in Rome June and last June. You know, I'm talking to these guys in Rome. I said, you know, you guys could have built 100 of these things. You only built three. And the guys in Rome said, we built three. I thought we only built one, you know. Actually, I felt a lot better, actually. <laughs> so, I mean, you could build as many as you want, but there just happened to be one instantiation. In fact, that is not architecture. That's just the, the result of architecture. 
Architecture is a set, it's not one thing, it's a set of descriptive representations relevant for describing a complex object, actually any object, such that an instance of the object can be created and such that the descriptive representations serve as a baseline for changing an object instance, assuming that the descriptive representations are maintained consistent with the instantiation. If you change the instantiation and don't change the descriptive representations, they will no longer serve as a baseline for ensuing changes in that instantiation. In any case, architecture is a set of descriptive representations. Now, you can classify those descriptive representations in two dimensions. One, di one dimension I called abstraction. I don't want to digress into saying why I happen to choose that word, but if you look at architecture for airplanes or buildings or locomotives or battleships or computers or tables or chairs or X, Y, Z, you know, they're, they're, they are, they're all going to have bills of material that describes what the thing is made out of. You have the functional specs that describes how the thing works. You have the drawings or the geometry that describes where the components relative to another. You have the operating instructions that describes who's responsible for doing what. You have the timing diagrams that describes when things happen and the design objectives that describes why they happen. You know, so it doesn't make any difference what object you're looking at. You're going to have bills of material, functional specs, the geometry, the, or the drawings or geometry, or uh, operating instructions, and so on. You're going to have that set of descriptive representations. Now, they didn't happen to stumble across that by accident. Basically, they're answering six primitive interrogatives. What, how, where, who, when, and why. You know, that's been known for since the origins of language about 7,000 years ago. The, and the linguists would observe for you, that's the total set of descriptive representation, that re, that you, you need, the total set of questions you need to answer to have a complete description of whatever you want to describe, a subject or object or whatever. Now, and now, if you don't answer all those questions, it's okay if you don't answer them all, but any, any one of those questions that you don't answer, you're basically, you're allowing or you're authorizing anybody and everybody to make assumptions about what the, the answers are that you don't make explicit. So if you don't make explicit those answers, you're gonna, people are going to make assumptions. You're authorizing them to make assumptions. Now, the good news is, if their assumptions are correct, it saves you time and money. On the other hand, if the assumptions are incorrect, that could be horrendous because the in, in corrupt assumption, correct assumptions are the source of defects, okay? That's where defects or miscommunications or discontinuity, that's where you have the defects come from. So you don't have to describe, you don't have to answer all the questions, but there's a risk associated with not answering all the questions. But, but and I did not invent that, by the way. That just comes out, that's a classification that humanity has used for 7,000 years, actually since the origins of language, basically. I, I did not invent that. I just happened to see the pattern. Now, there's one other thing I have to tell you. In a bill of materials, you have description of parts and stru part structures. There is no expression of functional specification in a bill of materials. There's no expression of drawings in a bill of materials. There's no expression of operating instructions. There's no expression of time. There's no expression of design objectives. There are parts and part structures. In the functional specs, there's functional specs. There's no expression of parts or part structures. There is no expression of, of geometry or drawings. There is no expression of operating responsibility. There's no expression of time. There's no expression of, of design objectives. There are functional specs. In the geometry, there is no expression of parts and part structures. There's no expression of functional specs. There's no expression of operating responsibility. There's no expression of time, no expression of design objectives. There are the, the geometry, the, 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 the drawings of the geometry. I'm not going to do any more. You, kinda, you get the idea. If you're trying to do engineering kind of work, you only want one and only one kind of thing in the picture. You start putting more and one kind of thing in the picture, that picture is going to get so complicated you'll never get your brain around it, actually. And if you're going to do engineering work, really what you want to do is normalize everything. You want to minimize any, any potential discontinuity, any kind of disorder. You want to normalize everything. In order to normalize everything, you have to see all the parts relative to the whole object. You have to see them all so you can get rid of any, uh, any reoccurrence or any kind of redundancy. You want to normalize, get the minimum possible set. You only want to look at all the functional specs, but you want to look for the whole object. You get it down to minimize, to minimize the complexity. You want to minimize the redundancy. You don't want any redundancy showing up and so on. You want to minimize everything. The minimum possible set of components to create the object. Somebody said that yesterday, it was an interesting one of the presentations, but in any case, you don't want any extraneous anything in that object, whatever that object happens to be, airplane or building or whatever. So I'm just making the observation. Now I'm going to digress. I'm going to leap forward in the logic a little bit for you. There's the engineering view 
for if you want to do engineering work, you want to see the whole, you only see, want to see one type of fact, but you want to see the whole set for the whole object, for the whole, uh, for the whole product. You want to see one fact, but you want to see the whole set of those facts for the whole object. You want to see one, fact, one type of fact, but the whole set for the whole object. But when you're doing engineering work, you want to see the whole thing, because you have to see how all the parts fit together, basically. Now, if you're doing manufacturing work, however, yeah, that's not what you need. You want to take one part, you want to decompose the object down to as small parts as possible, and then you want to see the characteristics. You take one part, you need to you know the part or part structure, you have to know the functionality of that part, the geometry of that part, the operating responsibility for that part, the timing diagram for that part, and the design objective for that part. So if you're doing manufacturing, you want to see all the variables relative to one part, okay? So there's two different kinds of models that, that are required here. You want, you want the engineering models, which are, you know, one fact is normalized set. You want to see one fact for the whole object. In the manufacturing model, you want to see for one part, you want to see all the variables for one part. So there's two different kinds of descriptive representations that are relevant for describing the object. Now, I would just observe this. Engineering versus manufacturing. Engineering work requires single variable ontologically defined descriptions of the whole of the object, which I would call a primitive. In contrast, manufacturing work requires multivariable holistic descriptions of parts of the object, what I would call a composite. That's the implementation, that's a composite. Okay, now, the, the interesting phenomenon, somebody talked about this yesterday too. In manufacturing, this is analysis. You break it down into small, smaller, smaller pieces. In, fa in fact, a good approach, if you want to classify, you want to deal with complexity. The way uh, humanity deals with complexity is through classification. You know, do a one-dimensional classification for manufacturing, decompose it down to very small parts. And the reason why that becomes useful, it's cheaper and faster to manufacture the part. You know, the smaller the part, the faster and cheaper it is to manufacture it. So, in, in the, so that's basically, if you go back to, uh, to uh, the wealth of nations, Adam Smith, you know, the idea was to break it down into smaller parts so you can manage the parts. But, but in doing that, basically what you're doing is you're disintegrating the object. You're, you're dis disintegrating it. In contrast, you know, if engineering work, you need to look at synthesis. It's not the, if you, if you, if you take a one-dimensional classification, you're, you're disintegrating the object. The same content can show up in more than one category at the bottom of the tree. If you want to do engineering work, you have to see how all the parts fit together. That's a synthesis idea. Okay, so if you just do analysis, you're doing manufacturing implementation work, you're going to get disintegration. If you do doing engineering work, you want to deal with the issue of synthesis. Okay, so so it's not a, an either or thing; it's an and kind of a thing. And and the these, the significant issue this is radically different. In fact, it was Fred Brooks that said. Programming is, is manufacturing, not engineering. So, so we, those of us who come from the IT community, have been doing manufacturing historically for the last 65 or 70 years, basically. In contrast, this is different. This, uh, this is standard down here. Th this stuff up here is radically different. Okay, so the reason why we build implementations and we, we get frustration on the part of the enterprise because the implementations are not integrated, not flexible, not interoperable, not reusable, not aligned, they're not meeting expectations. Fundamentally, if we, if we use a, a, a one-dimensional classification, you're going to end up with disintegrating things. It's not engineered. It's implemented, but not engineered. If you want the thing to be engineered, you have to have a two-dimensional classification. You have to have a, a schema, a two-dimensional classification, because you have to have two dimensions in order to normalize things. I don't want to digress into that, but but uh, you know, Ted Codd was uh, floating around, uh, you know, with a relational model. Before the Ted Codd had a relational model, there was no the words. We didn't even have the words normalization at that point in time. But you know, to to try try to manage the, uh, the, uh, the the asset you're trying to manage, you have to have to have a, a normalized structure. If you got to manage money, you have to have a chart of accounts. If you manage an organization, you have to have an assignment of allocation responsibilities. If you want to manage whatever you want to manage, you have to have a normalized structure, basically. So yeah, the, there's, uh, uh, if you want the thing to be engineered, you want an integrated, flexible, interoperable, reusable, and so on, then you have to do the engineering work. Those are engineering-derived characteristics. You don't get flexibility, integration, and so on from implementation. You know, basically, you get, op, you get implementation, which you get, which is really good. I'm not arguing against that. It's really, it's really good. But, 
On the other hand, if you need integration and flexibility and so on, then you have to do engineering work. So it takes you beyond merely the manufacture of the implementation. Okay, the other dimension, I, I gave you one dimension of the classification of descriptive representations, which I call abstractions. The other dimension I call perspectives. Now, typically, I would take a few minutes to, to tell, to uh, describe this for you, but I, I'm just going to kind of net this out for you. Now, back in the, uh, in the uh, late 60s time frame, we had defined, uh, me methodologically defined, how to transcribe the strategy of the enterprise. With a, but we had to transcribe it. We, we, we knew at the time you had to transcribe it in such a fashion you could do engineering kind of work with it. It's not adequate to transcribe the strategy in such a fashion say make money or save money or do good or do, you know, don't do whatever or, or feel, you know, I feel good or feel bad or go west or go east. Or, you, those are all relevant, but you've got to take those apart to create the descriptive representation in such a fashion we can do engineering kind of work with it. So we had what I would call today, these are late 60s time frame. We, had, we, we, we knew how to transcribe the strategy in such a fashion we could do engineering work. But what we did not know is we did not know how to transform that strategy into an instantiation such that the instantiation bears any resemblance with what the, what the, the strategy was fundamentally. So I, the, the problem is you know, we tended in those days, we tended to, to, uh, to uh, describe this in a somewhat an abstract fashion, you know, you know, make money or save money, whatever. But down here, you're telling a person, you know, how to put a piece of, uh, a, a, a piece of uh, metal in a lathe and how to turn it to get, you know, whatever you're trying to create. Or, or it could be a telling a machine what, what to do, in which case, you know, you're going to have a descriptive representation like 110011000. So there's a long way from make money to 11000. So, you know, and, and, the, and we didn't know how to make the transformation of the strategy to the instantiation such that the instantiation bears any redundancy of strategy. Now, we knew architecture had something to do with this, but we didn't know what architecture was. Okay, if you go back to the, the late 60s time frame. So I, my, I had a radical idea one day. I said, you know what you ought to do? We ought to go ask somebody who does architecture for something else, like a building, or an airplane, or a computer, an automobile, or X, Y, Z. Ask them what they think architecture is. If we could figure out what they think architecture is, maybe we could figure out what architecture is for enterprises. Okay, so that was my that was my 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 radical idea back in those days. I had a friend of mine who's an architect who built built buildings actually. So I went to see my friend Gary Gary Larson. The architect I said, Gary, talk to me about architecture. He said, well, well, what do you want to know? I said, well, I don't know what I want to know. Just talk to me, and maybe I'll learn something, you know. So he said, well, I get somebody to come in my office, I, and they want to build, say, I want to build a building. I said, well, what kind of a building do you have in mind? Uh, you, you know, you, you, uh, do you want to, what, what do you want? Do you want to work in it? Do you want to sell things in it? Do you want to, uh, to sleep in it? Do you want to get a house, or do you, do you want, you know, what, what are you going to do? Do you, what are you you got to manufacture things in it. Oh, what, what's, this, what's the structure of it? You got to have steel structure, wood structure, you know, stucco, glass, or whatever. I got to know something about the footprint. Where are you going to put this thing? You know, what's the what's the 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 footprint? That kind of thing. I I got to know what the workflow is. If you got to eat in the thing and sleep in the thing, you put the eating and you put the eating and the and the cooking in, uh, near each other. You put the sleeping someplace else. You got to know something about how the Workflows. I got to know something about the timing diagram. So if I got to design a building that has elevators, you know, it's an up button, you go up, and the down button, you go down. And I, I got to know something about the design objectives. Do you want to change this building? You want flexibility? You want to change this building after I get it built? Then don't hard bind the wall to the floor. You know, basically, you keep the wall, you separate the independent variables. You want flexibility? You separate the independent variables. Okay, by the way, we, all, we learned about that a long time ago, those of us who are in IT. You know, separate the independent variables. I haven't heard this for 30 or 40 years, but it's late binding. You don't want to bind anything together. You want to put bind independent variables together until you click the mouse. That's when you bind it together. Because as soon as you fix two things together, independent variables, you want to change one of them, you have to change them all. Okay, throw the whole thing away and start over again. So if you want to change things, you separate the independent variables. I like this for an idea, by the way. You have the data division and the procedure division. <laughs> oh, that's pretty interesting. Yo, yo, you can change one day element, all the instructions use that change element, use change, you want to change one instruction, one data element, all the instructions use that change element, use change data element. So you separate the independent variables if you want to change them. 
Give it, now, for manufacturing purposes, you want to hard bind them together. You know, you want to uh, bind them together. That's the implementation. So, so Gary says, well, I got to know what the what, what, if they want flexibility or whatever. I got to know the design objectives. So he says, I, I sketch out my bubble charts. I got to I have to understand what the boundaries are here. You know, so I don't get blindsided in effect. So then, if I'm going to build a hundred-story building, you know, some you know a huge building, then I'll, I may live with the owners for a couple of years till I find their aesthetic values, what they're thinking about, what the constraints are, you know, what they really want to do, you know, how much money they have, you know, what they what what, the, what, what their purpose is. I got to understand what the concept of that building is. So I transcribe the concepts of the building. And this is really important. I can take this down to a excruciating level of detail. Actually, I can build a scale model, sit in the corner of the room that has light bulbs that go on and off. I have water that runs through the pipes. I, you know, and I, I, I can build a scale model so that the owners can look at this and say, whoa, man, that is really great, you know? It's exactly what I had in mind. Or, whoa, that's not what I had in mind. So this is really important, basically, because if the owner, if this is what they have in mind, basically say, hey, okay, chief, Sign here, press hard on the dotted line. You got to go through three copies, you know. I have an architect friend right now today is in the middle of a massive lawsuit. And what happened was that the owners of the building did not want to sit down and define these models up here. So he said, no, no, you know what, the mo what, you know what we have in mind, so go ahead and define it. And, and uh, you, 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 we don't have time to work up, think about this or whatever. So the architect defined these models, and they transformed it into the instantiation. They built the building, but it's not what the owner had in mind, and it's a massive lawsuit. Okay, so it was interesting. My architect friend, I, geez, I went out to your website and I figured out. I found out why I'm having this lawsuit. <laughs> Fundamentally, you know, they were not they they were not involved in defining what these the, the concepts that building are. Now, Gary would say, once I get the concepts, now I have to transform those concepts into the, uh, into the design logic for the building. Because I haven't got the building design, I only have the concepts tra transcribed. Because now I have to deal with pressure per square inch, I have to have me metallurgical strength, I have to deal with uh, weight of water to m move the water around, I got to deal with earthquakes, I got to deal with a whole bunch of other stuff. So I may have some engineering specialization to help me transform the requirement concepts into the engineering design logic. In manufacturing, they call this the as-designed representation. Gary called that the architect's plans. He called these architect's drawings. He called these the architect's plans. Now, after he gets the architect's plans, I have to negotiate with the general contractor because the general contractor may or may not have enough, you know, the technology to build what I've designed. So I have to transform the logic of the design into the physical design, into the blue. I got the schematics here, but I have to have the blueprints. So the, the contractor has to, we have to negotiate and make the transformation. I have, may, may have some manufacturing engineers help me tra make that transformation. And in manufacturing, they would, call, they would call this as designed and this as planned. So then I, then I make the transformation so the implementation, they have the technology to implement is what I what was designed. So then the, this contractor goes to the subcontractors who have the tooling. They have to configure the tools or ex to express precisely what they want somebody to do in order to create it, and then you build the building. So oh, that's pretty interesting. So and, and you notice, by the way, there's some familiar words here: concepts, logic, physics, and effects. So you know you have the the owner's view and the thinking about the concept. The designer's view is thinking about the logic. And the builder view is thinking about the physics in effect. You have the, the concepts, the, blue, the, the schematics, and then you have the blueprints, then you have the configuration, then you have the instantiation. So that's the other dimension of the classification. Okay, now there's a two dimensional classification so a stru a structure. Is that an important idea? It's a really important idea. So if you want to normalize anything, you know, have to be looking at one fact at a time. You want to normalize every fact. You don't want anything in there that's extraneous. So you want to see the, the you want to normalize everything. So it's a two-dimensional schema, not a one-dimensional schema. Not a taxonomy or hierarchy or a decomposition. This is a two-dimensional schema. So and if you folks go back to the, your origins in the IT community, you know, the original databases typically were either they were flat files or hierarchical databases. They are no, not any good for managing data. They're build, good for building systems. You break it down, decompose it down to small parts, they're good for building systems. They're not good for managing data, for example. So then you had to have a two-dimensional classification, normalization, Ted God showed up and so on. I don't want to digress into that, but you kind of get the idea here. It's a two-dimensional classification. 
And I, I was in uh, Houston one day, and I'm talking about the, the uh, other dimension of classification. Some guy in the back of the room said, oh, that's reification. I said, that's what? Reification? I never heard the word before. Okay, so it turns out it comes out of philosophy. You know, Aristotle and, and, and Plato and those guys knew that ideas that you can think about are one thing, but the instantiation of that idea is a completely different thing. And in, if you want the instantiation to bear any resemblance with the ideas, that idea has to go through a well-known set of transformations. You have to identify it, name it, so you can have some dialogue about it. Then you define it. You have the semantic structures. Then you have to, uh, have, to have the representations. All the engineering design is done with representations, actually. And then you have to specify it based upon the implementation technology. Then you configure it based upon the tooling. And then you instantiate it. If it goes through that set of transformations, well-known transformations, then the end result will bear some resemblance with what they had in mind at the outset. OK, now, if you, you, if you don't go through that, basically, you know, you may or may not luck out and say, whoa, that was a, you know, a blind pig finds an acorn every now and then. So, so you may, may luck out. Well, that's pretty good. Yeah, but on the other hand, if you want to ha have any degree of assurance that whatever you're going to end up with has any, bears any resemblance with what you have in mind at the outset, it has to go through that set of transformations. And by the way, I did not define those. That, those came out of those of a couple thousand years anyway. And that's reification. And, uh, Re in the Latin, is the word, is the, the etymology of the word re is Latin, so it, it means thing, so reification would be thingification. So you're taking an idea and transforming it into a thing. That's the other dimension of classification. In any case, this, this is the framework for anything architecture. Okay? There are going to be bills of material, the functional specs, the geometry, or drawing, the operating instruction, timing diagrams, design objectives. That's one dimension. The other dimension. You have the scoping representation, the boundaries, you have the requirement concepts, the design logic, the plan physics, the, the tooling configurations, then you get the instantiation. So that's the framework for anything architecture. Now, I don't care whether you're talking about airplanes or buildings or locomotives or battleships or tables or chairs or whatever. It's anything, in effect. That's just the framework for anything architecture. Now, all I did was I put enterprise names on the same descriptive representations relevant for describing anything. OK, we, we produce the bill of materials, too. We, we would call these the inventory models. Actually, that's the business name for them. You know, the technical name would be entity models. You know, what's an entity? What's well, a set? Well, what's important about sets? Well, how many members are in the set, or are they all present or not? It's actually, the business cares less about entities. They don't care about entities. They care about inventories, in effect. So let's call them by their business name. It's inventory model. The technical name would be entity model. But, you know, the, Inventory model. Now, the system entity model would be the logic entity. In fact, we would call it the logical model, in effect. So, but that would be that would be sitting right there. But the bill of materials, we would call them inventory models. The functional specs, we call process models. Those are process. You take something in, you do something to it, you send something something different out. Input, process, output, in effect. You know? The drawings or the geometry, we would call the the geography, the distribution models, the locations where you store things and and transport things around. That would be the distribution models, or the geometry of the enterprise. Geography, maybe, would be our name. The operating instructions, we call the responsibility models, the workflow models. How, you know, what responsibilities you're going to assign to, to uh, ver various roles within the, uh, within the enterprise. We call responsibility or workflow. The timing diagrams, we would call timing models. Some people say the dynamics models. You know, the uh, J, J, oh, I don't want to, J Forrester at MIT. Uh, basically wrote the wrote the book Industrial Dynamics at the at the uh, it was a 1959 thing was published a seminal piece of work they were tracing resource flows in the enterprise they were using uh, manufacturing concepts in human systems and and uh, so they they called them dynamics models but a lot of times we'll call them timing models the design objective we might call a motivation model so I, all I was doing is putting enterprise names on the same concepts so it could find any older disciplines. And, by the same token, the scope context, we'd call scope list. We're just scoping out. Give me a list of inventories. Give me a list of processes. The requirement concept, we would call business models. Those are models of the business. And uh, the, 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 lo the design logic, we call system models. Those are the logic models or the system models that we call systems. And the plan physics, we call technology models. The technology constraint over extent. The part configuration, we call tooling models. And then the product instance, we call the enterprise. The enterprise is sitting down here. Actually, all this is architecture, but the instantiation is down here. You know, Alan really 
make some really good observations about business architecture. I have a whole other you know, observation about business architecture. <laughs> the question is, when you say business architecture, what do you mean? You know? And I was uh, talking to a big business uh, architecture conference, and they're having animated discussions, and they're getting real passionate about it. But th the fact of the matter is, they weren't defining business architecture the same way. <laughs> they, you know, they were all over the board. So I calculated, uh, you know, 176, I said this yesterday, you know, I calculated 176 different possible, plausible, uh, you know, definitions for business architecture. And I, and I made my conclusion for those guys, if, you know, you could be talking about any one of those, but if you don't define which one you're talking about, whoever you're talking to may be hearing any one of the other 175. Okay, so you got to get definitive about it, or else, you know, you're not, you're, you're like freight trains passing in the night. I, I'm, I'll tell you, you know, there are various combinations of these models up here, but somebody could articulate as business architect. That's basically Say so which one are you, are you talking about? When you say business architecture, you talking about the business process, or are you talking about the the objectives and strategies, or are you talking about the dis, the infrastructure di distribution structure, or what are you talking about here? You know, or are you talking about some combination? Oh, you have to talk about the inventories and the processes. So see those together. You, say, well, you can put what, together whatever combinations you want. And there's 176 possibilities basically. And I I say I don't you know. Basically, what I would do is I would have, you know, the, the, what I would call the primitive com components defined, and then depending upon what you want to talk about, I'll construct whatever, I, whatever uh, de definition you want to construct, in effect. Now, I just put the enterprise names on it again. And uh, so here is the framework for enterprise architecture. Now, I populated this frame. Well, here, here's the bills of material. Here are the functional specs. Here is the geometry or the geography. Here are the, is the uh, operating responsibilities. Here are the timing diagrams, and here's the design objectives. And here are the scoping representations. Here are the concepts models, the requirement concepts. Here are the design logic. Here's the, the uh, building physics, in effect, the, the as planned. Here are the tooling configurations, and there's the instantiation. So. That's the, the framework for enterprise architecture. I just put the enterprise name. You obviously saw what I was doing. I was just, I was, you could read the, the framework for anything words, but I was tell. I mean, I, you could read the framework for enterprise words, but I was telling you the framework for anything words. So it's all the, basically the same thing. So this is enterprise architecture. Okay, now I have some of these framework graphics. I, you know, the, any, anybody who wants to go to that to the workshop this afternoon will make sure they have a copy of it. And anybody who doesn't go to the workshop, we'll have them out at the table. Out at, so if you could pick up a copy. And, and uh, the, uh, the, I, I wrote a little article on the back, the John Zachman's Concise Definition of the Zachman Framework. You know, actually, somebody said to me one time, you know, did, did you ever read what Wikipedia said about your framework? And I said, no, I never read it. I, I don't need to read Wikipedia to find out the definition of the framework, you know. <laughs> so they said, well, you better read it, because whoever wrote it, they have no idea what you're talking about. So I went out there and I read it. They, they were right. They had no idea what I was talking So I fixed it. I wrote the article, you know, and put it out there. And so a couple months later, some friend of mine said, did you ever read what they wrote on Wikipedia about your framework? I said, I wrote it. Said, what? You wrote it. I don't believe it. It's not what you talk about. So I went out there and read it. And some yo-yo changed it back. See? <laughs> so I changed it back. See? And a couple months later, guess what? They changed it. You know, so I said, forget these people. In fact, it's, you know, I, I wrote my own definition of the Zachman framework. So that's on the back of the, uh, art, the little article. OK, now, I, you, know, now I, you understand what I'm telling you. This is enterprise architecture. It's architecture for every other object known to humankind, OK? It's ar architecture for airplanes. It's architecture for buildings. architecture for locomotives. architecture for computers. architecture for X, Y, Z. It doesn't make any difference. I just put enterprise names on it. And by the way, for those of you technical aficionados, the meta entity names are at the bottom of every cell. And there's only two meta entities in every cell, by the way. But the names are very carefully selected to make sure they are precisely unique and single variable. There's not any, you only have one and only one thing in each one of these, uh, one type of fact in any, any one of these uh, cells. And so in any case,
case, the this, this is enterprise architecture. Now, now basically, I, I have friends of mine who wanted, wanted me to change the name of this to Zachman Ontology, because this, if you recognize this, this is not a methodology. This is an ontology. This does not say anything about how you do enterprise architecture, top down, bottom up, left to right, right to left, where to start, and it says nothing about how you create it. Okay, this just says this is the total set of descriptive representations that are relevant for describing a complex object. And I happen to have enterprise names on them, but it doesn't tell you anything about how to do this. You know, people for a lot, a lot of years, would have, you know, they, they don't know what to do with this. So, well, you know, I don't know what to do with it. How do you do enterprise architecture? See, that's where, now you understand where I'm going to take you with this. This is an ontology, and you need a methodology. It is not either a methodology or an ontology. It is an ontology and a methodology. It's not either or, okay? However, this turns out to be the, uh, this is a, this is a an ontology. It's, the, it's classifying, it has unique categories of every set uh, every uh, every set of facts that are relevant for describing a complex object basically now by the way I, I, I there's another graphic in this and the, the reason I put this I only have my name is on a number of websites but I am excluded from those websites I'm not I have nothing to do with those other we websites even though they have my name on them there's only one web website that I have any access to that's zachman.com okay that's why I put that slide in there there's some other stuff in there but Okay, I, now you understand what I basically am saying here. I, architecture is architecture is architecture. I simply put enterprise names on the same descriptive representation relevant for describing anything. Why would anyone think that the descriptions of an enterprise are going to be any different from the descriptions of anything else humanity has ever described? I don't believe it. Now you can argue enterprises are different. Hey, airplanes are different than buildings, too. And buildings are different than computers, and computers are different than tables, and tables are different than chairs, and everything is different. They're all different, but they all have bills of material, functional specs, and geometry. They all have concepts, logic, physics. So this is basically architecture is architecture is architecture. That's my observation. Now, okay, you guys, I'm trying to do this in a very short period of time, and I haven't had, you know, a couple of half a day or a day to soften all you guys up, but get ready here you go I don't think enterprise architecture is arbitrary and is not negotiable my opinion is we ought to accept the definitions of architecture the older disciplines of architecture and construction engineering and manufacturing have already established and focus our energy on learning how to use them to actually engineer enterprises I think that's what we ought to be doing okay so I don't think it's it's, it's debatable architecture is architecture is architecture by the way uh, I can't remember who was I talking to. I think I was talking to Ralph Seegers this morning, and you know, I wrote an article, architecture, 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 out on my website. You can get that article if you want to get the article. Okay, now I have to tell you another thing: depth and width. Okay, for every cell, you could have a cell that's enterprise wide and it's excruciating a level of detail. That'd be the whole cell, basically. Or you could have a model that is enterprise wide only a medium level of detail. That'd be the half of it. You could have a Model it's enterprise wide at a high level of detail. So there's nothing that say, says that you have to be, have excruciating level of detail. I'm just saying that's another variable. Oh, by the way, you could have a model that's less than enterprise wide, it's, a, it's excruciating level of detail. It's half of the enterprise excruciating, or it could be the whole enterprise excruciating level of detail. So you have those two other variables. And you have to be able to, to, have, have to, be able to represent them in some fashion, okay? So the, the implication is anything that is white space here, if you don't make it explicit, it's implicit, which basically says that you're allowing anybody and everybody to make whatever assumption they want to make about them. And by the way, it may be fine. You may be willing to accept the risk of making erroneous assumptions. You can accept the risk of defects. In fact, manufacturing and manufacturing airplanes, they will accept some degree of risk of defects. When, they find, when the parts don't start to fit, it, fit together and the scrap and recoil work costs start to go up, now then they'll say, wait a minute, you can't complete you know, the implementation until you have a complete engineering design release. But, so that other variable you have to read into this, into this as well. Okay, there's two different things here, an ontology. I didn't even know what an ontology was until fairly recently. I'm going to give you my John Zachman layman's definition of ontology. Okay, now, now some of you guys may be ontological wizards. I, I, I don't know, but probably in a group this big, somebody 
really is familiar with ontologies, but the, Z the Zachman Framework Schema technically is an ontology. Ontologies have to do with their theory of the existence. Ontologies have to do with what exists, a theory of existence of a structured set that says a, a, cl a classification, a schema, is, that is, uh, th that is um, uh, rational, logical, you know, structured. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's not arbitrary of essential components of an object. Those components, essential components, it says the end object is dependent upon for its existence on the, co on the components, and the components the exist as well. So you have a, uh, a, a, a kind of an existence of the object is just of the components, for which explicit expression is necessary, and I said probably it's mandatory, for designing, operating, and changing the object, the object being an enterprise, a department of enterprise, a value chain, many enterprises, a sliver, a solution, a project, an airplane, a building, a bathtub, or whatever, or whatever. It doesn't really make too much difference what it is. It's whatever that object is. A framework is a structure. A structure defines something. Okay, in contrast, a methodology is a process. A process transforms something. And a structure is not a process, a process is not a structure. You've got two different things going on here. Okay, so now this, this is really an important idea too. Now I, 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 I you know, I, I, here's, a com, here's a comparison between ontology and methodology. An ontology is a classification of the total set of primitive elemental components that exist and are relevant to the existence of the object. A method, methodology produces composite compound implementations of the primitives. All the implementation, the instantiations, are, is, are derivative of the methodology. The methodology produces the implementation. And the implementations are compounds. And uh, primitives, elements, are timeless, and the compounds are temporal. Okay, now that's an important point to me. And I try to give you an illustration of that. Here is an ontology. Okay, I learned a lot from this metaphor, by the way. This is the classification of all the elements in the universe, actually. It's a two-dimensional schema. It's normalized, one fact in one place. It's two, it, you're classifying the elements of the universe in terms of the, neutrons and pro, the number of neutrons and protons and neutrons by the number of electron rings. That is not a process. This tells you nothing about how do you do this, top down, bottom up, left or right, right to left, or what compounds that you might want to create, create out of this thing. This just says here's the total set of elements from which you can create whatever you want to create. Okay, and once again, the, well, I didn't say this yet, but until an ontology exists, nothing is repeatable and nothing is predictable. There is no discipline. Before Mendeleev published the periodic table, there were chemists. They weren't chemists, actually, they were alchemists, okay? And they could produce, they were very clever, by the way, they were really competent, very clever. They could produce implementation, they could produce compounds. Okay, but it was not. It was a. It was based upon their life experience. It was a you know best practice kind of a thing, not based upon a theoretical construct. And elements. These elements are timeless. I mean, if you have an element that has six neutrons and protons and two electron rings, that's carbon. The rest of the world calls it car carbon. Do yourself a favor. Call it carbon. You can call it whatever you want to. But if you want to communicate with anybody else, just call it by. You know, the, the, the name that the, 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 is recognizable by the rest of the universe, in effect. So, now, in any case, those, you know, those are the elements, and they, and they are timeless. They are just forever. Here are compounds. Oh, this is a process. A process transforms that, creates something. This is the process. Take a bottle of bleach and add it to a bottle of, of uh, alkali, and it's going to get transformed into salt water. This is not an ontology. This is a process. You th take this, add it to that, it's going to uh, be, be, uh, be uh, produce uh, whatever you want to produce. Now, the compounds are temporal. That you produce salt water for some reason. It's something good for some whatever, or ex whatever it happens to be that you're trying to create. Here's some examples of other compounds. Th this is the uh, uh, an acid and a base, or a, 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 alkali, a base on alkali, so, and you get sodium chloride on water. It's a balanced compound. Here is hydrogen, here's hydrogen, there's the two hydrogens. Here's chlorine, here's chlorine, here's the sodium, there's the sodium, there's the oxygen, there's the oxygen. We could not have written this down like that until Mendeleev Mendele published the periodic table. Okay, we didn't have any notation to, to produce that. So here's some other compounds. Here's salt, that's sodium chloride. Here's aspirin, C9H804. Vicodin is C18H21NO3. Naproxen is C14H14. 
uh, uh, O3, ibuprofen, Viagra, sulfuric acid, water, and so on and so on and so on. How many of these can you create out of the periodic table? And the answer is infinite. They go infinite. Okay. I, and I, I don't want to take the time to elaborate, but, but it's infinite. And, and, and these are temporal. These are specifically defined to do specific things, basically. And uh, uh, now, okay, here's an ontology. How many different enterprises could you create out of this ontology? And the answer is going to be infinite again. Here And here, is not, until the ontology exists, nothing is repeatable, nothing is predictable. There's no discipline. Okay, everything is basically basically best practice. Okay, the primitives are timeless. Now here's some here is some compo compounds. You know the the elements are the what I would call the primitive components. The compounds are implementations or instantiations. Cobalt programs. You can read uh, Java two or Smalltalk or X what whatever you want to read. Objects, BPM, MML, swing lines, business architecture, capabilities, mobility, application, data models, security, art services. COTS, uh, technology, our big data, mission, vision, agile code, business process, don't have models, balance, core card, cause, IB, don't have artifacts, and so on. How many of these are there? Let's go infinite. How long will it be until we can add one to the list? So, what time is it? You know, so you, 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 people get really creative. They create a lot of these things. And these are temporal. They're good for specific, specific reasons at a specific point in time. Here is uh, alchemy. It's a practice. This is a methodology without an ontology. Process what you know, uh, Papa Munster down in the basement with a chemistry set. You know, trying things out. You know, and then, you know if it works, you know, that doesn't blow the house up. Write that one down. That's a good one. You know, so if it blows out, don't write. Right? You probably ought to write that one down too. Don't do that one again. Okay. So yeah, so it's a process with no ontological structure. Ad hoc is fixed, dependent on practice and skills. It's not a science. It, it is alchemy. It's a practice. Now, I got to tell you, the alchemists were really clever. Man, they figured out how to create gunpowder long before uh, they ever had the periodic table. Okay, so these people were really creative. Uh, however, you know, a few hundred years later, they, they had, at Mendeleev published the periodic table. Now, I don't know whether you guys realize this or not, but the periodic, we tend to think the periodic table's been around forever because the elements have been around forever. You know, that's basically learn that in chemistry or whatever. But the periodic table was only published about uh, 1890, 1880, 90 time frame. Now, if you think about this, within 50 years of the publication of the periodic table, the physicists and chemists basically were splitting atoms. Think about this. Once you have order, now research actually works. Things become predictable and repeatable. It doesn't have to, we don't have to learn everything by experience. We can hypothetically define other possibilities and get really creative, okay? But then, like I say, very short period of time, like friction goes to zero, and you can get really creative and really sophisticated in very short periods of time. So I just throw that one away a minute. So ontology versus process, engineering versus manufacturing, architecture versus implementation, it is not either or, it is and. And the question is, how did you get your composite manufacturing implementation? Did you reuse components of primitive ontological engineering constructs, or did you just build manufacture the composite ad hoc to some problem or some system requirement? Okay, actually, the enterprise is the total aggregate sum of composite implementations, in effect. So the question, how did, you get the how did you get the composite? Were you just building systems? Or did you have the, per per the periodic table of primitive components from which you assembled the implementation? Now, if you just build them to get the code to run, they're not going to be integrated, not flexible, not interoperable, not reusable. They're not aligned. They're not meeting expectations, typically. So the question, how did you get the composite, the compounds? Did you use, have the periodic table? Now, obviously, I'm taking you to a point where I'm saying, you know, it's not an and. It's a, it, it is an, it, I mean, it's not an or. It's an and. Now, I, 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 uh, Alan, Alan and I were talking about this yesterday. I don't want to take a lot of time to d develop this. But this came from Roger Greer. 
who was the dean of School of Library and Information Management at USC years ago. I, I just happened to run across some notes from a, that I had taken at an IBM Guide conference in 1991. And he was talking about, Roger was talking about, the difference between a professional and, and the trade. You know, the, he basically was making a differentiation. And the professional, this is a professional service cycle. The professional starts with a diagnosis, analyze the need, or diagnose the problem. Then you prescribe the solution. Then the, then the technician applies the solution, evaluates the application, and depending upon the evaluation, enters into the cycle again. So the professional, basically, the differentiates the professional from tr uh, trade or, or from labor is the diagnosis and the prescription. Okay, the, where the trade or labor is involved with the implementation and then the evaluation, okay? so. My observation would basically say, this is where the engineering is taking place. That's where you need the ontology to do the diagnosis and the prescription. And then you need the methodology to do the implementation, basically, the, the manufacturing. Engineering work is doing, going on over here. The manufacturing work is going on over there. So what differentiates uh, the profession from the trade? Well, it's, you know, if you start with the the, the diagnosis of the problem and the prescription, that, then that's what the doctor does. The x-ray technician shoots the x-ray, you know, takes the picture, and then, you know, evaluates whatever the result is, in effect, okay? So, uh, I, you know, it was really interesting. You know, we, those, you know, uh, Leon Kappelman, a friend of mine, is an academic guy. You know, he, he traces the CEO surveys for, you know, years and years, 20, 30 years, 20 or 30 years, the, the top, one of the top 10 issues that the CEOs of the world say that those of us who come from the information community need to deal with, basically, turns out to be alignment. Alignment. You know, basically, they, what they're basically saying, you know, I don't know what you guys are doing. You spend a lot of money down there in IT. Whatever you're doing with it, there's not aligned, not aligned with what I think the enterprise is about up here. Okay, so there's an alignment problem. I would submit to you. Yeah, you're, it's, it's, if you're starting over here, you know, you're never going to produce, you're going to always be a solution in search of a problem. So if we want to change it, and, and Alan and I really feel strongly about this, those of us who come from the, uh, the, uh, the architecture domain, uh, we need to be, begin to develop the, the characteristics of a profession. This is, is a profession, but that presumes a discipline, and I would submit, you know, the implication says, we, we need to change the whole con our whole concept to diagnose the enterprise problems. In fact, that's the one last uh, slide I would say I would use, and I'd say the end object is not to build the system. The end object is to diagnose the enterprise problem, and then and then you can prescribe. The enterprise is really complicated. So you could probably prescribe, you know, three or four or a dozen different possible solutions that they could pursue. So, okay, chief, here's this set of things that you can do. Somebody, you know, I think it was Steve Jobs in his book, you know, basically said, somebody said, you had to go in with two recommendations of Steve Jobs, but he had a third one in your pocket, okay, because he would tear them up, you know. And you have to go in and have a, you know, a, a third one. Or, or how many do you want, Chief? We, we can construct however many you want to. And you can evaluate or analyze them for whatever the implications are, whatever the capital and or expense implications or cultural you can you can analyze them and, and and let them understand what the alternatives are, what the implications of the alternatives. So they pick one, and they can do the implementation, and then they evaluate, and so on. I think this is what differentiates the profession from the trade. Okay, so I I, I think this is important. I you know the, the more I think about it, I think there's really uh, lessons to be learned here. Here's here's the research lessons that we've learned. It's possible to solve general management problems very quickly with a small subset of primitive components. Simply list and their interdependency short of the complete primitive model. You don't have to do a lot of architecture to begin to have enough that you can do the diagnosis of the problem. Uh, then different complex composite constructs can be created dynamically, virtually cost-free from the inventory of primitive lists and, uh, and addressing subsequent general management problems. Once you begin to populate the inventory of the primitive components, they are reusable to analyze or diagnose other problems. It's not just limited to, you know, whatever the 
precipitated the first uh, population of the, pro of, the, of the primitives. And many scenarios can be evaluated to test strategy alternatives before making commitments. You can, you can, uh, you, you can analyze the implications and, and make recommendations around those implications before you actually spend money or actually create infrastructure kinds of things. So I, the, these are really important issues. So here's my, I'm, I'm getting you to the point of draw conclusions. Here's, here's what I would propose to TOGAF. This is a TOGAF development strategy, okay? And I would evolve TOGAF to become an engineering methodology as well as a manufacturing methodology. Those of us who come from the IT community for the last 75 years, we've been building and running systems. Typically, you know, that's what people, uh, you know, say, you know, if you ask somebody from IT what they do for a living, we, we would basically say we build and run systems. So uh, all of us are very manufacturing dominant, okay? We're, that's the way we tend to think. We tend to think in terms of composite constructs. And all of, you know, every, every artifact, if it has more than one variable in it, I'll tell you, it's a manufacturing artifact. It's not an engineering artifact. I, I can tell pretty quickly by looking at the descriptive representation, looking at the model. If you have more than one variable in that model, I know you're using it for, for manufacturing, for Im implementation purposes. Probably manufacturing is probably, I, I'll say the implementation purposes, but I would just broaden TOGAF to begin to deal with the engineering issues. The way I would do that in phase one, in fact, I, and initially, I thought I was only going to tell you this. I'll tell you what I think phase two and three might be as well. And I, you know, I'm just, you know, getting creative here. So I don't know whether, you know, Alan may say, well, that's interesting, Zachlin, but you're out of here, you know. We don't, we don't need a lot of help. We already got enough uh, things to do here. But first of all, I would exuse the existing data gathering process to populate the inventory of single variable primitive models. I would just say, you, you're already doing the gathering. And I would just factor out whatever the primitive components are and begin to populate that the, the, the inventory. And, and uh, we have a little workshop this afternoon to show you how to do that. You know, it's actually, it is not that hard. It's pretty quick. You'll, you, anybody who goes to workshop, you'll, you'll see it. The workshop is created in order to, you know, just show you that it's not like this is too complicated. You can do this, okay? So I would just use the existing uh, uh, data gathering portions of the methodology to begin to populate print. Then I would reuse the primitive components in the creation of the present TOGAF artifacts. Now, you, you know, you've got to create the artifacts anyway. You might as well just re reuse the primitive components. Now, that presumes another thing for those of you guys who are into the tooling domain, but particularly in the tooling domain. But you'd have to map the primitive meta model against the TOGAF meta model. So there, there is a meta model issue here, okay? so. But it would, what that would tell you is you have to look at the meta model, the TOGAF artifacts, and see what, if there is a composite construct in the meta model and just parse out, factor out what the primitive components are. So that would, that's the way you would map the, map, map the, my, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the composite you're trying to create from the primitive implementation. So, I mean, that's what I would do. That would be, you know, just looking at the, you know, right where we are today. Okay, here's a set of primitives. Here's the methodology. Let's, let's just use the methodology to do engineering work. Yeah, and, 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 and we still end up creating the same implementation composites. Okay, I didn't know, I mean, I was getting creative. I, here's what I would do. Here's what we're doing. I probably ought to say it that way. I, and I encourage you to do this, by the way. I would extend the methodology for enterprise problem diagnosis and solution prescription, single variable primitive co components, binary relationship impact analysis. You know, what you need is, what you need in order to do the, the diagnosis is you need the primitives, the single variable uh, primitive constructs, and bi only binary models, because what you're gonna do with this is do impact analysis. You touch one thing and here's all the other things that are impacted by it. Man, that, that application has been around for a long time. And I'm not telling you something that nobody knows how to do. But this is dependent upon, you know, single variable models and binary models. Building a binary model, it, is this related to that? Is this related to this? Just two things at a time. The models are pretty simple. I'm not going to take more time to do that. But then I would segue to the current TOGAF methodology. I would come out of here and go into the current methodology making whatever en enhancements incrementally as practical. I, start to, I would start to, you know, you, you've been doing the improving TOGAF forever for the very, since from the very beginning. I would just start to begin to improve it based on what we learn with the diagnostic and the prescription uh, enhancements. 
then phase three, here's what I'd do next. I'd orchestrate the transformation from the toll gap artifacts to the implementation of lower roads. I mean, I would, I would orchestrate that transformation. So, so, you, so you've got the transformation from the, the strategy up here to the concept, the logic, the physics, tooling configuration, then the instantiation. I, I would or, I'd get deliberate about that, orchestrate that, and I would extend the TOGAN's governance process demanded all reification transformation. I mean, we, we the governance uh, process in TOGAN is really strong. And I would just take a hard look at that and you know elaborate that to, to, to manage the entire reification set of transformation. That's where I take it to. Okay, so I mean, I I, I don't know. You, you, some of you guys may say, "Oh, forget it. We're not. You know, it takes too long to cost too much." Whatever the argument might be against it, but but I think that's where I would go. Principally, I think that's where I go because of the implication of changing the fundamental concept of enterprise architecture. The profound significance of this, it alters the concept of enterprise architecture from one of building models to one of solving general management problems. Man, that would be really interesting. It buys the time for the experts to build out the complete enterprise architecture, the thing relationship thing, primitive models, iteratively and incrementally. You don't have to do it all at once, a little by management, general management problem by problem by problem, iteratively and incrementally, start building out a little more, adding to the primitives that over time. Then it builds significant credibility for the information technology community. And I would submit, you know, we, you know, we need all the help we can get. All, you know, the, if we can, if we begin to perceive, be perceived to be the enterprise doctors, not, you know, we, we would be, we would be perceived to be direct, not indirect. You know, it wouldn't be an optional. It wouldn't be optional. It'd be, you know, mandatory kind of a responsibility. And then what I would say, but most importantly, it would position enterprise architecture to become a general management operational process, not simply an IT exercise. Yeah, I think that's where we gotta go. If we could change the perception of enterprise architecture to be one of solving general management problems, we would have no problem getting the resource and the time to do it, whatever enterprise architecture we wanna do. The pro that valuation issue would tend to go away. You know, we tend to have a, you know, I saw a presentation yesterday uh, about the valuation, we're talking about the, the Internet of Things, and it was really, really a, a creative presentation. I really appreciate it a lot. And, but I would say, you know, if, if we can solve general management problems, you wouldn't have to worry about valuation. <laughs> now, I'll, I'll say one more thing about valuation. The fundamental problem with architecture is that it doesn't save money in the current accounting period. It's not expense. You don't make money or save money in the current accounting period. You're building an inventory of assets. What, what's, what, what's making an asset different than an expense? Well, how many times do you use it? If you use it more than once, it's an asset, in effect. Okay, so you build an inventory of assets. The assets don't save you money in the current accounting period, but they enable you to make money or save money in many accounting periods in the future. And the problem with asset valuation, the, the, CP, the, the accounting people are precluded in the U.S. I don't know about other places, but they're precluded from putting values on assets. They, they, probably because they, 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 it, it is not, there's not a, an absolute way to, to value the asset because the value of it is deriving from how many times you use it or deriving from you know, what the market will buy, pay for it at some point in time. Okay, it's, it's, not, it's, it's difficult to, to value assets and it's really difficult to value intellectual assets, which I would submit enterprise architecture is intellectual asset. And we're just beginning to learn some things about that. So. But that issue turns out to go away, I think. If you can solve general management problems, you don't have to worry about valuing uh, the value proposition. Okay, you guys, hey, I, I, I think I made it in an hour. Well, actually, an hour and three minutes. I owe Alan three minutes now, and uh, that's not, you know, not too bad on my part. But uh, we're, there will be a panel. We'll have some discussion, we'll answer any questions. And uh, then uh, also there's a workshop if anybody cares about trying to work with some of these things by You'd be glad to do it. Okay, thank you, Alan. And thank you guys for taking the time to listen. To I, I appreciate it a lot. Thank you. Let me see. You see over here, so the guys over there aren't blocked out by the podium. So you put a, a, a fair challenge to the architecture forum. It's not me that decides on how we evolve TOGAP, it's the architecture forum. And uh, there's some challenges there for them to think about on that. So we've got some questions, and uh, you, we talked about professionalizing um, enterprise architecture, which, as you know, we both feel passionately about, and having the um, 
these professionals as the enterprise doctors, as you say. And uh, the person to ask the questions is actually the uh, CEO of the AEA, ah, uh, Steve okay. Nunn. And uh, it is now 44,000 members, uh, which is, you know, and, and they're actually active as well, which is great. So, Steve, what have you got? Yeah, unsurprisingly, uh, no shortage of questions and compliments on the presentation, John. But I'll dive straight in so we don't waste time. Long question, but bear with it. Given a composite of an enterprise, a methodology existed for its construction. Today, I have a million assets with individual change records associated with them. The EA methodology did not govern the maintenance after construction. What do you suggest to correct the EA to the ontology? Well, I, that's not uh, atypical, by the way. I think that's where most of us live. Uh, and those I nor normally make the case, those of us who come from IT, we have been manufacturing the enterprise the last 70, 60, 70 years. The enterprise was never engineered. Uh, we were manufacturing. So we're manufacturing parts. We don't manufacture the enterprise. And the parts don't fit together. Okay, so what do you what do you do if you manufacture parts that don't fit together? Well, actually, scrap and rework. There's no way to fix that problem after the fact. So, if you want the parts to fit together, you have to engineer them to fit together before you manufacture them. After you get them manufactured, and then try to fit them together, and it's, you can't get there from here. So, uh, one thing is, you want, we're all sitting in kind of the same position. So, my observation would be, well, somebody's got to break the pattern. Okay. <laughs> So you, if you just keep on writing code, you're just going to get more parts. You know, you're not going to you're not going to change anything. So you have to have a different paradigm. Okay, and I was describing for you a different paradigm. In effect, I was describing for you an engineering paradigm. And what I would do is I would do just exactly what I said. I start taking toe gap. We already have this methodology, very widely respected, very widely used. And I would I, I would I, I would take the methodology, the data gathering methodology portion of it, and I would begin to populate the inventory of primitive assets. And I, I, you don't have to have them all, but you have to begin, okay? So you see, they have to have some, whatever you, you can in the, in a, out of the uh, toe gap activity that you have at your disposal. And once you do that, then you, the whatever you're, you're gonna populate them with the primitives that are required to create the toe gap composites right now. So we, so we, can, we can produce whatever we're producing out of toe gap right now. So I would just start with something I know. I would have my hands on. I could start with toe gap. I would start to populate the primitive artifacts and then create by reusing the primitives to create the composites. So I'd start with there, and then I begin to enhance that over time. You know, I begin to en enhance the methodology to to uh, elaborate. I gave you some thoughts about how I would enhance it, but in the meantime. What, what you can do is once you start creating the architectural constructs, you, you have to orchestrate your way out of where you're at. You know, we, we in effect, what we have, we don't have a blank sheet of paper when we start with our enterprise architecture. We, we already have an enterprise out there. And uh, so you have to figure out a way to migrate out of the existing environment into the architecture environment. And I, if I, you know, I'm, I'm just going to tell you what I think the solution is without elaborating how I would use it. But I would use it, the data warehouse kind of a concept. I create the architecture, I extract and, and transform uh, the the you know our, the data basically out of the existing application to populate the architecture environment. And uh, uh, and then what I would do, and I I didn't learn this, I didn't figure out this out myself. Betty Spinelli, a woman at uh, Kodak, Bill Inman, and I were sitting in the Kodak theater one time when Betty was saying, once we have the architected data, we know what the data is, now we're going to rebuild all the transaction processing systems to update the data warehouse, and then after we update the data warehouse, we're going to turn off the, the, le the legacy system. So over some period of time, however long you want to take, you just move it out little by little, transaction by little, uh, transaction by transaction into the architected environment. I, and if you're going to if you're going to rebuild the transaction processing systems to populate the uh, to populate the uh, the uh, data warehouse, then I would add the process specification. I'd add the distribution. I'd add the other char uh, other characteristics of architecture. And that's the way I would orchestrate my migration out of the existing environment. Uh, I I think I better. You yes, know, I probably got about another <laughs> twenty minutes to do it. There's also a sense. Um, that came out of that question that 
uh, the architecture, once it was done, it was done. And then things changed afterwards. So there was no concept, really, that the architecture should be referenced any time you make a change to the instantiation and to update the architecture accordingly. Well, Alan, that's really an important point. I tell you, you know, the, I, I tell you where I learned how to manage change. I, I, I sat up there at Boeing, somebody from Boeing, I sat up there at Boeing for it took me about ten years to figure this out. But how do you how do you manage changes to Boeing seven forty sevens? You know, very carefully, right? Yeah. You don't walk around in a Boeing seven forty seven with a hammer and screwdriver making it changes. Forget that. You got on engineering administration, who are they? They are managing the drawings, the functional specs, the bill of material and so on. You pull out the one you want to change, you change the artifact. And then you figure out the impact on the adjoining artifacts. You gotta look across a row, but you figure out the uh, impact. You make changes to those other artifacts. You don't throw away the old version. You keep the old version. It's regulated in the airplanes. You have to trace the artifact back to the last time that airplane flew successfully. But once you change the artifact, then you go down to the shop floor and put together the change kit. You take the change kit out to the Boeing 747 and you put the change on a Boeing 747. If you manage change in that fashion, the bo you minimize the time, disruption, and cost of changing the Boeing 747. And every artifact precisely represents the Boeing 747 as it exists at this moment. Now, one thing that people tend, would not tend to know, every Boeing 747 is unique. They're all different. And they have a set of these artifacts for every Boeing 747. Trace it, you can trace it back to the origin wherever they changed it, the flu except for the last time. And Boeing 747s have not complicated enough. These, these artifacts are on paper. Okay, the first electronically designed airplane was 777. Okay, so now you understand the reason I'm telling you this. What you, if you, actually you really want to change the enterprise architecture before you change the enterprise. See, if you have a general management responsibility for enterprise architecture, this is a piece of cake. See? Say, oh, by the way, Miss Ms. Vice President of Marketing, before you change your allocation responsibility, your organization responsibility, come up and see me. We'll change the repository first, and then you can change the re re allocation responsibility. Oh, by the way, Miss Ms. Programmer, before you change a line of code in that program, you come up and see me. We'll change the repository first, and then you can change the line of code on the program. Or be, be, before you change anything, you change the architecture first, and then you change it. And, and uh, by, by the way, the, the, uh, you, you, it's, all, it's dynamic cause, because you, conti have you continue to solve problems, you continue to populate, put mm -hmm. more you know, our primitive components into the architecture. So that's, that's why this becomes really important. <laughs> to become a, a general man, it becomes an operating responsibility for general management. If they really understood what they had, they had the knowledge base, everything they could possibly know about the enterprise. They could change anything, or they'd have a great deal of uh, uh, creativity to do lots of things they haven't even dreamed about doing before. So that's really important idea that that, that becomes a general management uh, is integrated in, into the enterprise operation. Steve, you got another one? Yes, a few. Um, <laughs> oh, geez. Does anyone want coffee? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's anybody? the thing. Yeah, it's a, it's a trade-off. Um, uh, somebody wants you to get to this before Wikipedia, I think, but have you considered what changes might be required to your framework to accommodate an ecosystem of multiple enterprises? Yeah, the, I, uh, the, uh, that's what I would call federated architecture. Okay, Some things you want common uh, with more, more than one enterprise and some things you want to leave provincial, if you will. So some things you want to make federal, some things you want to let, leave provincial. So the, the, uh, the, the problem we have now is that you, you, when you try to make things common or federal, when they're not common, that's where you get the hate and discontent. So the framework is really helpful for thinking through. But you know, what do you want to make common? You want to leave provincial in effect. So that's the way you need to deal with that. And that would be you know, any complex environment. You know, you, most every enterprise these days have, there's more than one framework uh, that you might possibly want to populate, uh, but then you have to have to understand what you want to be the, the same right. and, and, and yeah. what you want to leave unique. So that's the way you would handle that. Yeah. So you have a, a you know, you, if you're an architect, you pull out the drawing for the entire urban landscape. You pull out the drawing for specific buildings. You pull out the drawing for functions yeah. with that. Yeah, actually, this, 
Yeah, it was implemented uh, just very quickly. I was implemented. The, this uh, I learned that I didn't invent this either, but I learned it from the province of Ontario, who was a premier about 20 years ago. Got pretty creative. He sorted all the departments in in the province of Ontario into categories. He called them clusters. He had the human. He had the uh, social services cluster, the land cluster, the finance cluster. And then he put a super minister in charge of each cluster, and, and, and the, the role was to integrate, to you mm -hmm. know, get rid of all the re redundancy and make it as uh, you know uh, as integrated as possible. And, and they, that's the what that was the approach they were using, you know. You you so you have a you have an integrate, you know, a, a, a federation at each, each cluster, but then you had the federation at a second level up at the uh, the uh, the province level as well. So. That's the way okay. it is. Steve, um, do you envisage a common connector from a given architecture development method like TOGAF, DODAF, FEA to the Zachman framework? Yeah, basically this, uh, you know, when we talk about the, uh, the, uh, the workshop, we'll try to get into that a little bit. If you have the primitive components, to say, okay, which uh, which uh, set do you want, Chief? You want the TOGAF components? Click, there's a TOGAF. Oh, you want DODAF? Oh, no problem. Click, there's the DODAF. Oh, you want balance scorecard? No problem. Click, there's a the balance scorecard. Oh, you want your profit and loss statement? Click, there's a profit. Well, what you're doing is you're creating a composite, basically dynamically, you know, whatever whatever the composite is you want to take a look at. Mm -hmm. And, uh, boy, I'll tell you what, I you know, I was really impressed with Dawn's presentation yesterday because I'll... I, mean, I was at Raytheon last week, and there was a there was a presentation I'd seen recently about the hardware, you know, the price performance improvements of hardware and the capabilities in hardware. And what it basically was saying is that you 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 will be able to put big data, all this unstructured data, all this data on a chip, and that chip will go in your processor. And the guys at Raytheon said it's not when you can do it; you can do it now. So you have a, a big data on a chip, and you can a analyze that big data and find a you know, threat or opportunity or something external or even internal in the unstructured data. The immediate question is going to become, how's, what are you going to change in your enterprise? Are you going to increase or decrease the inventory? Are you going to increase or decrease the process transformation? Are you going to increase or decrease the, the storage capacity of the node? What are you going to do to your enterprise? So you, if you have big data on a chip, you can dynamically identify threats and opportunities. What do you think that's going to do to the decision cycle? It's going to reduce that decision cycle on a very short. So you're going to have to make up your mind what you're going to do real quickly. So therefore, you like to prescribe several alternatives. Okay, chief, here's the three or four alternatives. Which one do you want to pick? It's going to shorten our decision cycle dramatically. And and Dawn, it was frightening me yesterday. Yeah, we're not talking about the sweet by and by. Goodness, she was talking about stuff that is here now, and that's what the guys at Raytheon were telling me. This, this is here now, mm -hmm. okay? So mm -hmm. I, when, I, when I, I talked about big data before, I, and the fundamental question is, uh, once you figure out what is you know, something external or even internal, the question, what are you going to do with your enterprise? Where is your enterprise architecture? What are you going to change? Next question is, who's working on your architecture? Somebody better be working on this. Boy, I'll tell you what, I don't think too many people have an idea of the sense of urgency we have here. Because you're not going to do this in a day. You know, you, uh, we're going to have to start working on this, and yep. you got to eat this elephant bite, bite, bite. It's not going to happen over, not overnight. Steve? Uh, yeah, how can the um, Zachman framework be applied to create an architecture description that can be implemented later on without falling into a complex design that could be difficult to construct and maintain. And following on, on from that, how do you avoid those descriptions becoming out of date since organizations change so quickly? Well, I, I think that whoever posed that question, they're, they're thinking about this from a manufacturing perspective. They're thinking about it as a composite construct. And if you separate the independent variables, if you populate the primitive components, don't bind anything together until you click the mouse. And then you can change any primitive component anytime you want to. Okay, so you don't you're not locked into anything. You 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 can change with minimum time disruption and cost. You can change one variable without changing everything. So I mean, so the question is is couched in terms of 
you know, our classic understanding of enterprise architecture is a big monolithic static. It takes a long time and costs a lot of money. That's the wrong idea. You know, basically, you, know, you, you build this iteratively, incrementally, primitive by primitive by primitive, and then you can create the composites on the fly. Okay, it's basically that would be the the, object, the approach that I would take. I, you know, you, you're not creating fixed implementation, compi extreme complex complex implementations. That's probably not the way to want to, you want to do it. Okay. Short question: um, Is business architecture part of enterprise architecture or something different? Well, I you know out of the context of my framework, I started to suggest that you know. Uh, some people say, well, the business process is, our, is architecture, which would be column two, row two, you know. Some people say, well, no, it's actually column six, row one, you know. Some people say, well, it's actually the, uh, the composite of column one and column two at row two. That's what. Some people say, you know, you can have any, different, have any combination. I, uh, the, a chief operating officer of a utility I worked with, this is years ago now, he basically said, my, D, my DP people in those days, my DP people want to talk to me about data, process, and network. And I don't care about data, process, and network. I want to talk about allocation, responsibility, business cycles, and, and uh, strategy. Okay, he said, I don't want to talk about column one, two, and three. I, want to talk, I, I only care about column four, five, and six. I could not believe this guy said that. I, in fact, knew the guy. I can't believe you. You, 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 you don't care about the inventories, you know, the process transformations, and the distribution structure. Are you kidding me? In a utility? Come on. Yeah, I, you know, I, it's just unfathomable. Okay, so I, I just would say, uh, you know, at some point in time, you're probably going to wish you'd, you'd have more and more and more of these printers. You build them up iteratively and incrementally over some long period of time. In effect, and it's not, you know, there's not one way to do it. There's n different ways to do it. Some work better than others, you know. In mm -hmm. fact, if you got a tested methodology, I'd use that. Why not? Well, I think it depends on which one of the 176 different definitions of business oh, architecture you use. Geez. Yeah. Yeah. If so, I'm you know, in in my definition, the people I spoke to in Australia and New Zealand had the title business architects, and they quite clearly felt that they were part of enterprise architecture. But the other side of things is that some of the greatest business architects have been Bill Gates, Michael Dell, Steve Jobs, Jack Welch. Yeah, I, you know, I was pontificating around the, uh, you know, architectural idea, and I lost sight of the business architecture question. Uh, the question turns out to be, which primitives do you want to consider? And if you want to say, I want to uh, open up new markets, okay, then we got to figure out what inventory is going to need, yeah. what process, what location, and I would c create.
those those tend to be deriving from the, these ideas about architecture. And I, I learned it all of this. I, I didn't invent any of this. I learned it by looking at other people. I saw the patterns. All I did was I put enterprise names on the same architectural constructs as in any other object. And then I learned about migration. I learned about federation. I learned about 